live everywhere. Daily Coast Radio on NetWorksRadio.com presents David Walker, Kegro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Wednesday, February 28th, the last day of this February. Of course, in a couple of years, we'll have an extra day in February. Uh, by the way, that makes it actually one of my nephew's birthdays, I guess, sort of. We, I'm, I've never been clear what you do with a February 29th birthday. But hey, uh, for operational security purposes, nameless nephew, happy birthday of some indeterminate number. Anyway, we're ready to roll with today's program. Sort of, kind of. Uh, I was a little late on the trigger with, uh, not the actual trigger, don't get worried about things like that, with uh, our interlude music, but I think we got the show started on time, so I guess we're ready to roll. It is an awkward Wednesday, Wednesday usually the day I can kick back and have a uh, brunch while on the air because we are usually accompanied by both Greg Dworkin and Joan McCarter. Greg, out today implementing a brand new interesting electronic records keeping program at work and uh, he warned us about that if you recall on the air a uh, bit of a programming note i also i will have to do something other than a live show for friday which concerns me a little bit because it's usually indictment day but indictments usually come down after we are off the air anyway we'll try and prepare something for you it may be time to run one of our reruns we i think we now have enough shows with commercial breaks in them that we could actually get away with that Uh, Not that it matters a great deal, but at any rate, going to have to be off the air on Friday, so we'll have to pack it all in today and tomorrow. Joan McCarter is still scheduled to be with us. It's uh, We're not going to be without any rational basis in current events as we were yesterday. However, I think we put together a pretty good show yesterday. Daily Coast Radio is live now. That's what really matters, Bill says from Portland, Maine. Fair warning, Kegro X, that's me, doesn't have a $31,000 dining set, just a sturdy IKEA table, quite true. A microphone and the truth. I am going to search around online to see if I can find some of the truth to share with you, uh, some of which you may already have read this morning. I don't have a $31,000 dining set. Ben Carson does. I did not get to that story yesterday. Uh, though I think perhaps that uh, Justice Putnam did manage to get that in on the list, if I recall correctly, for yesterday's follow-up show, the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And uh, yeah, that's a that's a a hell of a story. Uh, why not start with that one too? I'll scroll back and and grab the story. By now, you would likely have heard that the Secretary of Housing and Urban Dining, Ben Carson, has. Uh, defied all of the protocol officers, I guess. I don't know who you would uh, talk to about this <clears throat> over at HUD and redecorated his office. His wife very much wanted to redecorate the place. Who would have guessed that they would have had a different interior decorating aesthetic than the state and probably rather stodgy, say, mid-60s era wood-paneled Housing and Urban Development Secretary's office. I'm sure it could really use a makeover. Though, you know, the guy had, you know, I don't know if he's the guy, you know, like Donald Trump's administration would be a bad time to do makeovers for anything. Everyone made all the jokes about the, what his decorating style, what he might do to the White House. Um, and so far, he hasn't been horrible with it, although the winter uh, holiday, because not Christmas, we don't say that anymore. Um, the The Christmas decorations were a little weird and scary, although if you saw them in the right lighting, I think they looked a lot better. They weren't that weird dystopian Narnia thing that we saw with originally. Uh, They looked a lot better in the right light. I don't know why they released that photo. They have a photographer there and a whole press office and everything. Uh, That too in the news. But uh, I guess Ben Carson's like maybe the second ranking nightmare interior decorator guy in the administration recalling the bizarro uh, paintings that he keeps in his house of him and Jesus, which, you know, I mean, it's a nice theme, but I wouldn't really put that up. But then again, I don't look anything like Ben Carson or Jesus for that matter. And uh, we never posed together. So I you know, I don't like Photoshopping Jesus into my portraits or my selfies, essentially. An oil painted, 
Oil on canvas selfie with Jesus. All right. Anyway, uh, he decided to redecorate the office, which, like I said, is an understandable impulse. Apparently, if you want to spend more than $5,000, and that's not a lot for a decorating budget, to be honest. I mean, I don't know why I should be fair. Don't be fair. Who cares? Those guys are, are terrible. I don't need to be fair to them. $5,000 is not a very big budget, but you can spend more. You just have to get some sort of explicit permission. If I understand correctly, they might even have to have congressional permission. Congress is full of Republicans. They would likely have given him permission, although I, if they have seen the paintings, they might not have. And also, Ben Carson is black. And they might not be okay with that. I don't know. I mean, he's he's one he's one of the good ones, I guess. He's our friend, right? This is the uh, this will take us back to the uh, White House Communications Office story about Hope Hicks. How does she do it? She also in the news. I believe she uh, 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 admitted to telling. For whatever reason, this is the term they use for white lies occasionally while in the White House, I guess, which which is, I guess, where white lies belong uh, on behalf of Mr. Trump, as they like to call him. Uh, I don't really know why we call them white lies. And I'm wondering, like, does she tell the, the, the one white lie I can think of is I have black friends. I'm not a racist. That's that's it's other things, though, that count as the white lies, I guess. Anyway. Ben Carson, in the course of his decoration binge, I guess, uh, well, one, for one thing, the HUD official who told him, yeah, if you want to spend more than $5,000, you got to get special permission, apparently got um, uh, demoted and has filed some sort of like ethics whistleblower lawsuit about this. And this is how this came to light. But along the way, uh, in trying to spend lots and lots of money in redecorating the place, apparently they managed to find a way to spend $31,000 on a dining room set for the office. Now, I... You can find $31,000 dining room sets. You just got to shop someplace like super stupid to do it and be willing to to part with $31,000. I mean, there are such dining room sets, obviously, uh, but not where normal people shop, I don't think. Uh, We do, in fact, have an Ikea table here in our... It's not our dining room table, though. I guess we should... But that's our kitchen table is Ikea. I don't know where the hell the other one came from, but it was... Not a $31,000. I don't think it was a $1,000 table. I hope. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I guess that raises the question also not only of why are you spending $31,000 on a dining set, but why are you spending $1 on a dining room set for your office? I am not clear on that exactly. And it may be that all cabinet secretaries' offices have dining room sets because they, I don't know, they frequently, perhaps, I would imagine, you could convince me that they host lunches and dinners over, you know, work topics. And I don't know who you bring in. There's important people that would have something to do with your formulation of policy, if that was something you did as secretary of whatever the hell it is you're into. Uh, and, okay, working lunch, working dinner. I, like, to me, I'm like, you're a Republican. You're a fiscal conservative. We're slashing your budget. Brown bag it, you jerk. Just bring a lunch. Eat at your desk. What's his name from Wisconsin? Can't get enough of uh, Instagramming and tweeting pictures of his bologna sandwiches. And this guy is spending $31,000 on a dining room set. It had a hutch, I'll, I'll point out, in case you were wondering, how do we get the total up to $31,000? Fancy table, lots of chairs. It had a hutch. And I mean, <clears throat> dining room sets do have that in a sort of a quaint pairing. I mean, what do you need a hutch for? In the office, like literally at this point, you're going to put the, the official HUD China out on the hutch? Little uh, Yadro figures of you and Jesus together hanging out. I have no idea what you would be putting out in a hutch in the HUD office. They should have got a HUD, I guess. I don't know. Stupid way to spend money. Uh, the story that I saw originally reported over at TPM, by the way, I think I'm going to have to get rid of my ad blocker. Somebody a while ago suggested a very good ad blocker that, uh, was originally installed to, uh, stop auto playing video 
from popping up. And I don't think it really ever achieved that in most cases. But now it just gets in the way of everything. Everybody has programmed their news site to block out the news I want to read with a big thing that says, looks like you're using an ad blocker. Yeah, I am. And, uh, and, and also, by the way, even when I whitelist the site on ad blocker, uh, and reload, it still thinks I'm using an ad blocker and it really bothers me. So I'm going to have to get rid of it because half the news I try to read gets blocked, at least temporarily, by that. It looks like you're using a, an ad blocker. Uh, it looks like you're annoying. So shut up and tell me the news. You're free. Just show it to me. I know you get, I don't know, I guess they get income from the number of times they show people ads that they ignore. Uh, TPM reported this one uh, that I picked up on. HUD official says she was demoted for refusing to blow budget cap on decor. And boy, did my eyebrows go up when I was refusing to blow. Oh, my God, please. Budget cap. Okay, well, still, you gave me a heart attack there. Caitlin McNeil for uh, TPM on this one. Uh, Let's at least get the name of the, the person on record here. Senior official at the Housing and Urban, it's development, not dining, as it turns out, department alleges she was demoted after pushing back on requests to spend more than was allowed on the redecoration of Secretary Ben Carson's office. The Guardian reported Tuesday morning, The Guardian all over the place this week. The official Helen Foster filed a complaint to the Office of the Special Counsel, a government watchdog, and The Guardian obtained the complaint. It's not Mueller's office. It's a different one. In the complaint, Foster alleged that acting HUD director Craig Clemenson directed her to help Carson's wife, Candy, Candy Carson, really, access funds to redecorate Ben Carson's office in January of 2017. And I don't think he had been confirmed yet, but they knew it was coming. When Foster informed Clemenson that there was a $5,000 budget cap on redecorating, Clemenson told her that past administrations, quote, always found ways around that and later told her, quote, to find money for Mrs. Carson, according to the complaint. Clemenson also told Foster in February that $5,000 will not even buy a decent chair, per the complaint. It it will, um, but I guess not if you are fancy schmancy. So I don't, I don't know who that guy is, Clemenson. Foster said in the complaint that she was demoted after pushing back on Clemenson's demands. She also alleged that she was blocked from handling a Freedom of Information Act request related to Trump appointee Lynn Patton. And uh, she is the one, I think, is Lynn Patton the one who was the, um, yeah, she's the HUD Region 2 administrator. And I think she came to the job via party planner for the Trump kids, which is pretty good preparation, really, overall, when you're thinking about uh, serving in the Trump administration. But uh, okay, whatever. And then the $31,000 dining room set, I think, was something that got dug out later on. I don't even know if it was in the uh, the the Guardian's version of this thing. I did a quick scan and I didn't see the thirty-one thousand dollar number pop up. So I'll have to uh, note to self. I'll forget it by the time I'm off the air to find an article for citation for the thirty-one thousand dollar figure. But I'm sure you all believe me. Uh, Bill wouldn't lie to you. Not in the opening tweet. Not right out of the box. Okay. Let's see. Oh well. Uh, Marianne enjoyed the idea of Yadro figures and dinnerware in the HUD hudge. Uh, so good. I'm glad you like that one. We had, we, we've got some coffee snorting reports of the last couple days too. I forget which one set us, uh, over the edge yesterday's show. Albert Titus says the pyramids were actually great China cabinets. <laughs> that makes for a good callback there. And Karen says, uh, having lived in senior officer and senior civil service quarters as a child, I can tell you that the U.S. government has whole storehouses full of stately furniture available to cabinet secretaries. That's true. I mean, I think that's true. That rings true. That I I don't know. I am speaking after. I, here's what I say. I say that one rings true, and it's true of over in Capitol Hill, um, decorating the offices of congressmen, uh, very similar. And you got a lot of options, but the furniture is all pretty standard, and there are warehouses, and by the way, hallways full of abandoned furniture down in the basements of the Capitol complexes. And uh, a lot of that is stuff like, we don't want this anymore, so they put it out, and you can go and steal it for your office. Um, 
But uh, yeah, you can redecorate your office in various ways. And I think they give you a budget initially when you come into an office. You can change the carpeting. Uh, you know, not very much. It's not, and it's not very terrific stuff. And they were buying from an approved list of vendors. That's true. We really do have a procedure for all of this. The point was that they had to go and get permission if they were going to do a major renovation. And uh, they stuck to the approved vendors and all. It's just really $31,000. Come on. When you're cutting budgets for the poor, it's just exceptionally rude, I think. And I think everybody else thinks so, too. All right. Let's see. Other... Uh, uh, suggestions for today. Oh, well, here's some technical suggestion. Matthew Rigdon says, if you're using the latest Mac OS, I think I am. I'm very late in getting the show started on my Mac OS, so that's probably it. Uh, autoplay video is disabled in Safari without an ad blocker. Oh, see, I don't use Safari. I guess maybe I should. I uh, don't know what I you're using. I am using, I still use Firefox, but I use Wiper, W-I-P-R, for blocking, which allows you to flip it on and off while browsing with a toolbar. Okay, very interesting. Okay, thanks. Uh, I like to share the tech updates. Lots of you uh, are are tech adept, maybe gun adept at all uh, also. <clears throat> but, um, you know, uh, I appreciate the tech tips. And uh, I just like to try and keep it less than complicated. That's not too hard. I don't know why I don't like Safari, but uh, I got used to Firefox. I'm sure I can make it work. And besides which, honestly, it doesn't work for blocking autoplaying video. And also, I don't open those articles on the same computer that broadcasts. Occasionally, you'll hear in the background, oh, autoplaying video started again. But it's not as much a disruption as it used to be. Michael Musson says, Ben Carson, sure, he did nothing wrong. Found the cash under a mattress, uh, which he got from, you know, for, for $30,000 on the cheap from somewhere else. Uh, well, I think that's probably enough time on Ben Carson this morning. There's plenty of other uh, nonsense happening elsewhere, but the, the Ben Carson story, uh, a good one. We'll dig up the $31,000 figure. Yesterday, we, in, in trying to find our way in the second hour of the show, uh, thanks to Armando for helping us through that, and I think we sort of stumbled into the discussion of something that turned out to be fairly significant and important and we kind of discovered uh, one theory of the the collusion nexus that's been evading certain skeptics. I'm sure they weren't convinced by the thing, but I put together a thread yesterday explaining what we began discussing in the second half of yesterday's show about uh, the one nexus of collusion between Russian operatives, Russian intelligence, the Russian government, Russian oligarchs, Russian freelancers, etc., uh, other assorted 400-pound figures on various beds, uh, some of which may or may not have been purchased with HUD funds of one kind or another, um, and the Trump campaign. And it all seems to come together under the tech umbrella and Brad Parscale and their their digital operations. He's now named as campaign manager for 2020 which tells you a great deal about where they place their emphasis. He's not a political operative. He's a digital operative. And basically it means that uh, once, well, just like the last time, we are going to run the same campaign, essentially, which means that a sitting incumbent president will be running not on a record of accomplishment or let's continue the record of accomplishment into the future or whatever, but instead will be running on an anti-government, America is a hellhole, uh, deplorable, poisonous BS smear campaign against America and Americans and we're going to, I don't know, I, I, because we sit idly by and let it happen again. We you know, obviously will fight. But I mean, there'll be people who sit there and say, yeah, this is normal. So be prepared to, uh, you know, hit them over the bridge of the nose with a rolled up newspaper at some point, get their attention and and uh, point them in the right direction uh, about what's going on here and, and, and who's doing what. Jared Kushner can't stay out of the news. He allegedly has lost his, uh, his well, uh, his sense. Uh, he's, he's been robbed of his senses. He's lost his security clearance. Uh, I say allegedly because the announcement has come forward from uh, Chief of Staff Kelly, John Kelly, saying that, uh, yeah, he's lost his top secret clearance. How do you know 
that he has lost his top secret clearance? The answer is you do not. There is no way you will ever know. Uh, if I were John Kelly, I would say, because there's a lot of pressure about the topic, that Jared Kushner has lost his top secret clearance. Now, if I were John Kelly, I would also contemplate uh, knowing how angry both Jared Kushner and probably Ivanka would be, and therefore Donald Trump would be, to find out that this was the case, since he's placed so much trust in Jared and given him such a broad portfolio of uh, national and international uh, security issues. Uh, it's being reported, of course, by everybody quite correctly, that there's literally no way that uh, he could handle his portfolio of of work without a top secret clearance. He's just he would just be collecting a check for doing nothing if that were the case, which may in fact be the case. And in practical purposes, yeah, it is the case. He's not doing anything and not telling anybody anything that they don't know and he's not leading the effort or anything. So he is in a, in a sense already just collecting a paycheck for what amounts to a no-show job. But uh, he likes to read the intelligence, and I think he likes to sell it to, uh, you know, foreign operatives. I, I just think that. I just really do. Um, and uh, it's just, uh, you know, uh, other countries think so too, and that's problematic. Um, so really, though, I don't think that he's lost his top secret clearance. I think that I'm sure that the paperwork that says he no longer has the clearance exists, but I think they're just going to tell him whatever it is that they, you know, have and whatever it is he supposedly, quote unquote, needs to know uh, whenever they find it out. And they'll just say, well, you don't have top secret clearance, but the president is de facto. You know, he's going to wave his hand at this stuff and say, I uh, instantly declare if you get in trouble, call me and I will instantly declassify it so that you're not in violation or something like that. And we're, just make sure he gets what he wants whether he's selling it to other countries or not. And the paperwork will just say he doesn't have top secret clearance. And every time somebody complains, but he is getting top secret information if he's handling the Middle East portfolio, that's just true. Well, this paper here says he doesn't have that thing which you said was bad. Okay. I mean, really, that's all there is to it. I think they just, they just fake it. All right. Uh, oh, I found the $31,000 story from the New York Times. Ben Carson's HUD planning cuts spends $31,000 on dining set for his office. And I still do have questions about where they even put that thing. That must be some sizable office in order to fit a dining room set with a hutch in it. Although, you know, whatever. Okay, uh, let's see. So, yeah, I mentioned uh, Jared Kushner. And I guess just to be clear... We should discuss the Washington Post article from a day or two ago. Kushner's overseas contacts raise concerns as foreign officials seek leverage. Shane Harris, Carol Leonig, Greg Jaffe, Josh Dawsey, all on the byline for the Washington Post on this one from yesterday. Uh, look, it's just, we'll put it as bluntly as possible by reading what's here. Officials in at least four countries not this one, for other countries, have privately discussed ways they can manipulate Jared Kushner. So there's five countries. Our country is definitely discussing this, but this article is about other countries. Manipulate Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law and senior advisor, bad idea, by taking advantage of his complex business arrangements, financial difficulties, and lack of foreign policy experience, duh, according to current and former U.S. officials familiar with intelligence reports on the matter reports which Jared Kushner, uh, till the other day, had access to reading anytime he wanted. Among those nations discussing ways to influence Kushner in their, to their advantage were the United Arab Emirates, yeah, of course, China, China, yes, Israel, we knew about that too, and Mexico, the former and current officials said, it is unclear if any of those countries acted on the discussions, 
they all did. But Kushner's contacts with certain foreign government officials have raised concerns inside the White House and are a reason he has been unable to obtain a permanent security clearance, the official said. How do you like that for a catch-22? You can't do this job because you don't have a security clearance. You can't have a security clearance because, you can, well, because you can't do this job. But because you are meeting with too many foreign officials before we know whether or not you're like actually trustworthy. And of course, there's that gigantic debt that his family's business has. Um, there's the fact that his family has been selling green cards to Chinese nationals in exchange for half million dollar increment investments in his company. Uh, we know that he has hit up the folks in the UAE for millions and billions, possibly, of dollars after getting turned down by the uh, sovereign wealth fund in Qatar. And then, of course, that he backed the UAE and Saudi Arabia in their blockade of Qatar once they refused to give him the billions of dollars he needed to bail out his businesses. That is concerning. Israel... I know that there's already a pre-existing relationship between him and Netanyahu and the Netanyahu family. Mexico, I guess, is the new one, the surprise on this list. And I'd be curious to know what they think they would manipulate him into doing. Kushner's interim security clearance was downgraded last week from the top secret to secret level, which should restrict the regular access he has had to highly classified information, according to administration officials. Uh, so that's the loss of a revenue stream, as many have speculated. There's far fewer buyers for just secret level information as opposed to top secret. So it's just going to become that much more difficult to trade our American intelligence for cash that Jared Kushner can stuff in his pockets or save his family's business with. It is a tragedy, and uh, we're all very sorry to see it happen. We are, of course, not sorry to see it happen. We're very glad, and we just wish that they would kick him and his wife both, and his dad, father-in-law, out of the White House already. We'll be back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrox at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Hi, welcome back to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. <clears throat> Just uh, scanning the Twitter wires here for a moment, uh, came up with this interesting thing here. Uh, did we discuss, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, it may or may not have made the air for us the other day, the uh, story about the church slash possibly madrasa in either Wayne County, Pennsylvania or Afghanistan, I'm not sure which, which is holding a, a blessing for AR-15 rifles. And uh, that's because here in America, something, 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 guns, freedom versus try having your local clergy bless your AR-15 rifles at a highly publicized ceremony. If you attend a mosque rather than a wacko church in Pennsylvania and uh, see how long that lasts. Anyway, I guess it's happening today. Is it happening right now or, or are people just tweeting about it now? Because what today is... Wednesday is that a is that a day where you would end up at church normally at this hour I don't know anyway it says here some worshipers are arriving with assault style rifles that are being checked for live ammo and then zip tied because as you know uh, AR-15s are kind of dangerous items it's interesting now that they're bringing them into their church they have to be checked and cleared and zip tied so that it's impossible to accidentally discharge them with live ammunition. And that is wise, but it is interesting to note given that they, they, you know, these guys think that these things can be and should be safely carried 
in and around school buildings with live ammo in them so that you can fire back at an attacker on a moment's notice. But when they have to bring them to you know, this church, no, they got to be cleared and zip tied. One woman had to return a clip. Oh, you said clip, not magazine. A clip to her vehicle at Sanctuary Church's blessing ceremony that according to WNEP, uh, being reported by the Twitter feed of Jim Hamill, a WNEP reporter and anchor. So interesting. Uh, I guess we ought to probably note for the record that uh, that you know that that's the case. That uh, interesting that you guys want to carry these loaded around school kids, but not in your church. Hmm. That is a bit of a weird development. Just thought we would pass that one along. And uh, let's see. Uh, which other uh, items ought we to pick up on in our first hour roundup here? We'll jump back out of the Kushner story and check around. Ah, yeah, here we go. So yesterday we spent some time constructing a theory, which I think probably will hold up, about the nexus of collusion between the Trump campaign digital operation and Russia. It didn't, and And it came from... The Wired article that started out as an attempt to explain uh, how and why the Trump campaign was able to use and manipulate Facebook and other social media in order to win the campaign, even without Russian help and or without Russia's direct participation in buying ads. In other words, that the ad expenditures by Russians didn't do a great deal uh, to change the outcome. But we're not really sure about that, and we have some doubts because of the multiplier effect that the engagement, uh, what would we say, the, the, the level of engagement that Trump ads tended to foster because of their sensationalist nature, as we discussed yesterday. If you missed the show yesterday, the basic premise was that the Trump campaign and the Clinton campaign paid vastly different rates, essentially, for advertising on Facebook, which on its face is wrong and uh, counter to our election law. But because we have never gotten around to regulating Facebook like we do newspapers and television and radio, the... uh, I guess, I guess, maybe, I don't know, somebody could probably make the case differently in court if you got it there. Uh, but I, I guess we didn't require that they apply the same ad rates to both campaigns in the same way. And so uh, we explained how it was that that came about, which was that Facebook doesn't just sell ad space. They have a weird algorithm through which they sell ad space and how they price their ad space. And essentially, because they're in the business of creating online engagement, the more attractive, the more engaging your ad content was, that is, the more times it was shared, liked, clicked on, whatever, um, the the better it is for Facebook. And so Facebook encourages that by giving you a essentially what comes down to a cheaper ad rate for content that gets clicked, liked, shared more often than boring, staid political advertising that says things like, if you would like to have a nicer future and not be bankrupted by medical disaster, vote for someone who has a plan to do that whoever that person may be. Um, and that's not nearly as clickbaity as, you know, my opponent uh, maintains child sex dungeons. I mean, I wouldn't click on that, but other people apparently would. And so basically they found very quickly that the more engaging the content, the lower the price to place that content in front of more eyes on Facebook, where people are increasingly turning to get their news and information, even if they don't think they're looking for news. They're getting information that way. And also, as it turns out, the more salacious, ridiculous, outlandish the content, the more engaging it was. So what is that? The transitive property? The more outlandish the content, the lower the price to place it uh, as an ad on Facebook. 
who specialized in either creating the most salacious content or in feeding the minds here in the United States responsible for coming up with salacious content with actual dirt that they were stealing along the way in the form of either opposition research, stolen emails, etc. Uh, so where was that coming from? That, of course, coming from the Russian-sponsored hackers. And that's, I guess, uh, one of the better illustrations of at least one of the nexuses between, there may be several, between the Trump campaign and the Russians and the guy who uh, conceived of the methodology by which stolen Russian intelligence could be converted into, uh, one, effective ads for a campaign, and two, very cheap ads at that for the campaign. It was Brad Parscale. Now he's the campaign manager for 2020, even though he's got no policy positions on anything and has never handled politics for anybody in any capacity before working for Trump. Usually, you know, your campaign manager for the reelect of an incumbent president is a pretty major statesman. Normally, uh, you would, you know, if not a professional campaign manager, uh, you know, career wise, somebody who's been a major fixer in your in, in your world, in your administration. And that's just not the case here. Anyway, um so we explained how that worked, and then I, I came across uh, a response to that thread that I put together on Twitter from a guy whose name I'm not going to be able to pronounce. Paul is his first name. That I can totally pronounce. And uh, let's let me let me. He's German or German speaking of German extraction. Could be Austrian. He is Austrian, as a matter of fact. Uh, last name. Fuchs Jaeger, uh, the Jaeger part I can deal with. It's uh, F-U-X, and there are several ways to pronounce that, only some of which would pass muster on public radio airwaves, which we don't have that problem at the moment. And Jaeger, which, of course, we all recognize from Jaegermeister, our favorite refreshing beverage for uh, post-sporting activities, etc. Uh, like, it's the Gatorade of Germany, is what I'm saying. Uh, Paul, so Fuchsjäger, I'm not going to venture anything else besides that. However, Paul, uh, an interesting guy, uh, and clearly an, uh, an educated person in the, I don't know whether he's uh, uh, self-educated or... Uh, formally educated in, in tech and other areas. He's, let me read you what he says. Bridging to techno-social gaps, trust, what does it say? Trust mediating protocols, software, radio, energy efficiency, permaculture, self-determination. He's got his, my guidelines here at criticalengineering.org. So he's a, he's a tech kind of guy, but definitely has a crossover uh, capacity here. And he, having seen the thread on the nexus between the Trump campaign, as I view it, and the Russians and uh, flowing through Facebook, he actually says, I tried to sum this up in 2016. Really? Well, it turns out that, that he did try to sum it up on his blog, Paul's PhD blog, Capturing Thoughts and Documenting Progress is the... Uh, tagline there. You'll find it at paulfuchsjager.wordpress.com. And it's a real thing. And I'll read it to you. It's not that long. Um, let's just grab this here. This is dateline, well, dated November 22nd, 2016. So pretty close to immediate post-election period, 2016. Summary offered up at the top. If capital is able to gain control over the political information filtering process down to an individual level, all common values and democratic institutions dissolve. Well, for November of 2016, that's quite insightful. 
it's in, quite insightful for right now, of course, but I, especially so, I think, for 2016. And it's interesting, even as I read it, that's one sentence, and it encompasses two or three like overarching themes that I feel like, I imagine in my head, that we have covered on the show over the past couple of years. If capital, capital, is able to gain control over the political information filtering process, that there's a lot in there. A capital able to gain control over the political information filtering process, whatever filtering process means. Uh, I, I know that we've discussed in the past, like the concept that surely eluded the founders in their design, the grand design for our Republican form of government here. The idea of individuals being able to amass so much capital. I don't think they really conceived of billionaires per se, and uh, I don't think that they really thought about the possibility of such enormous concentrations of wealth that you would have, say, people like the Koch brothers who would say something literally like, I want the Congress to do X, Y, Z, and we're only the two of us, but I will spend $400 million on campaigns to essentially buy the kind of compliant Congress I want. They didn't contemplate that. They didn't even contemplate the now quaint notion that somebody like Ross Perot could run for president because he was enormously rich. And then, of course, I doubt very much that they thought very frequently about somebody like Donald Trump doing it. But, you know, the door was open, I guess, once Ross Perot showed us that it could be done. I will simply spend my billions on creating a campaign for president and support for it from out of nowhere. Um, I don't think that they really thought that that was possible. So, but that's a really big deal. And of course, we've also talked about information processing capacity in the, mostly in, in the sense of, in the terms of the government being able to do these things because the governments they did in fact conceive of as being able to concentrate enough wealth and power to do enormously dangerous things. That's kind of what they're all about. Um, but, uh, you know, like we, uh, the evolution of technology having given us the ability to uh, even just something small scale like scanning license plates or finding biometric identifying information of people, things that uh, human beings weren't capable of doing, actually taking in every optical clue out there and then processing it in some through some algorithm and and you know coming up with ideas about who might be dangerous or where is everyone in the world at this particular moment and where are they going? And now, uh, you know, cameras and uh, computing ability makes it possible to actually capture all of this, track it, analyze it in near real time. We've talked about that, but this is political information, not total information awareness. If capital is able to gain control over the political information filtering process down to an individual level, something that the vast fortunes as imagined in the past could never possibly be capable of doing. You could hire enough people to spy in the olden days on everybody in America and find out what they're reading. But that would be so, I mean, it's physically possible, but so enormously expensive as to make it impractical at the very least. This is the biggest understatement possible. It's impractical to do something like that. Now, of course, uh, one spying is very much automated and two spying might not even be what we need. And three, uh, people actually do have, uh, vast personal fortunes that could cover the costs of something like that. Thanks to, uh, automation having made it so much cheaper and everything else in the world having given them so much money. But so what happens as a result of all of this all common values and democratic institutions dissolve. And though I think we were all afraid that that might be the case if Trump won the presidency in November of 2016, I don't know if we all understood. I mean, I think we did from watching him campaign. We just figured, well, the stupid things that he's saying he's going to do if he wins the presidency, one is a moot point because he won't win the presidency because there's no way America could go in for this idiocy. But there was. And we increasingly worried that it was the, a possibility. And two, 
um, we just thought, you know, uh, if he were to win, and this is still largely true in a lot of ways, he'll just find out that, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Now, he declares that he doesn't care, and that's problematic, but every once in a while a court gets in his way or something happens or he forgets what he promised he was going to do and stuff never comes together, right? But uh, I think since then, we've certainly found that, yeah, one of the outcomes from this problem described by Paul here is that all common values and democratic institutions at least can dissolve or can move towards dissolution. And I don't know if we all fully grasped that. So here's the full story here. Attention continues to shift from broadcast media to social media. As of today, it ends up mostly on platforms that are funded by advertising. This leads to engagement maximization filtered personal feeds. That is to say, once again, to put the emphasis in the right place, it leads to engagement maximization filtered personal feeds. That is, using individual feedback signals as controls input. The optimization process leads all users being separately shown only those messages that maximize probability that the individual user keeps paying attention to the feed. In other words, uh, Facebook is a giant drug of sorts and its main purpose for existing, well, its main purpose for existing is, of course, to make people uh, who own pieces of it rich. And the way they do it, though, the, the, the basic business model of Facebook is we will use a computer algorithm to try and do all the calculations that would be too complex for humans to do. We'll use computers to figure out what are you looking at and for how long and what are you likely to want to look at for as long? What are your likes and dislikes? What can we do to individually tailor what gets presented to you by our system with the idea in mind that it will make you want to continue engaging with the system, right? The, the more, they're more valuable. Facebook becomes more valuable by the minute um, as more and more people spend more and more of their time engaging with the platform. That's what it's all about. And if it's advertising driven, then they don't care what gets advertised and you're not even supposed to in the advertising business and the media business. You're not supposed to really pay that much attention to it except in the extreme cases. And there are a lot of extreme cases. Um, but not we don't care what gets advertised and we don't really care how it gets advertised, particularly if we are exempt from or never came under the control of the regulatory schemes in most developed countries that they have for mass media since they realized much earlier with those other existing already existing mass media that giving people a steady diet of lies is bad for civic society and we never really applied those to these new and emerging technologies but uh, they don't care what gets advertised. They don't care how it gets advertised. Just so long as it keeps you interested in staying connected to their network and therefore making you a better advertising target. Our advertising clients will want to spend more money with us if we are able to report to them accurately that millions and millions and millions more every day are spending millions and millions of millions of hours more each day on our system. Where do you want to advertise where they're not watching or where they are watching, where they turn it off and go to work or where they never have to turn it off because they can keep it open at work and obsess with it daily. And the answer is we want to spend more money on that second one. The optimization process of course leads to all users being separately shown only those messages that maximize probability that the individual user keeps paying attention to the feed. Give me more, give me more. And because it's done by computers, it can be different for everyone. And so not only is everyone addicted, but they're not addicted to the same thing. They're addicted to totally different content, but they love the delivery system for giving it to them. And so they are not going to want to see that dismantled. Next section here, fear causes ignorance. A theory exists that claims the recent democratic shock, parentheses, significant erosion of common values in a short period of time, end parentheses, is caused to some extent 
by these filtered feeds in combination with another filter, human cognition itself. That sounds so dramatic that I think we'll play some music. Human cognition itself. And then that's when the music should really have come in. We all share one hard-coded trait. Messages related to short-term personal security always get prioritized over everything else. So, if more information is presented than can be easily processed, and we all know we're in that position, the most fear-inducing messages, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or FUD for short, and I guess that's actually terminology that gets bandied about in certain disciplines, uh, if more information is presented that can easily be processed, the most fear-inducing messages, FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, tend to still get perceived while the rest tends to be ignored. After all, individual attention is a finite resource, uh, and that's important, right? Computers don't have that. Fi it, I guess they are finite, but their capacity for more attention to more things is much greater, and they save us the work of paying attention to stuff and processing it and figuring out what it means. The analysis is just delivered to us via algorithm later on. Individual attention is a finite resource and personal security is always most relevant to us. Elections are currently, quote, won, unquote, by injecting FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, into the network and letting them get self-amplified by feedback mechanisms, thereby spreading misinformation and drowning out everything else with unprecedented efficiency. The result is a misinformed and fearful electorate, specifically in areas of high social insecurity and low availability of alternative information channels, like, let's say, I don't know, meth-addicted Appalachia and elsewhere. And, uh, you know, uh, gated communities and uh, country club enclaves where there's no diversity whatsoever and it in would uh, breed fear even if there was. Researchers in the field of personal data markets have been warning about the effectiveness of social media-based voter suppression techniques in the current system. The, quote, winning campaign openly talked, of course, we know this, about making use of them. And remember, though, this is written in November 2016. He's already on to this. In a recent book on modern autocracies, the current situation is referred to as the system is vulnerable to someone who acts in bad faith. I feel like we have heard this on the news here before as well. And it's something that Brian Boitler is writing extensively about. And we all knew that Trump was acting in bad faith even then and much earlier, really. We know that that's been his MO since the 1980s. But like I said, I think this is one of the earlier syntheses, syntheses of this these disparate lines of thinking that I've seen. How to improve? Advertising itself is not the problem. The erosion of common values starts to sharply increase when individual feedback signals are used. Hmm, yes, if we're all individually consuming news in our cubicles and it's very different, but presented in the same format, maybe even by the same platform, we all still think we have shared something, <clears throat> but we're getting individualized news feeds. Those signals were not available for broadcast TV, the idea of individual feedback signals, but they are abundant in social media. As more loops can cause more nonlinear effects, all cultural processes, election results, and geopolitical developments in general get increasingly unpredictable, eroding trust in common institutions, the basis for peaceful coexistence. And of course, it will only be amplified, I would add, if the message that you're getting, <clears throat> thanks to your individual feedback signals to the neural net, basically, out there, the Facebook network, if your sig feedback signals are, I'm already a paranoid wacko or whatever, but if you begin to, you know, to uh, look like you appreciate news about how we really ought to be fostering and eroding trust in common institutions like journalism, fake news, everybody, or, you know, everything's photoshopped or, oh yeah, right. There's no such thing. Russia thing is a hoax or, you know, Pizzagate is real or whatever. I guess for that matter, there's a P tape and you'll see it in your lifetime, right? Could be the same thing. Uh, 
then you're just going to get more and more of it. And that's troublesome because, of course, it makes things unpredictable, eroding trust in common institutions, especially if the news you're reading is about how common institutions suck. And that is, at bottom, the basis for our peaceful coexistence. But attention won't ever return to broadcast media. Individual feedback signals will continue to be available. So what's next? Well, the proposals here, one, regulation. We could force platforms to make algorithms observable and then force them to limit their individual selectivity in order to slow down the erosion of common values. Or perhaps more plausibly, he suggests, two, direct funding. This is an interesting idea, something I've been interested in for, you know, making a living at what we're doing here, this this show. But uh, so different approach to a similar idea. Develop methods to directly fund publishing and aggregation, making engagement maximization itself an obsolete business practice. That's big forward thinking. How are we going to make that work? Long term, only the second option seems effective. If so, how can we speed up this process? Well, there's a bit more here. We'll have to take our break in the middle of it, but let's get what we can in before the break. Let us dream is the next section. In the future, there's a support button on every reader or player UI, user interface, in the same way that there are share and like buttons on our current UIs. Thus, the barrier that lets funds flow from readers willing to support writers directly to writers, or let's say podcasters, is as low as readers doing a single tap after they have read the piece. That additional tap does not lead to a how much is this worth to me cognitive load. Instead, it controls... uh, Oh, wait a second. We've got to make sure we're ready for our break here. Music, please. The additional tap does not lead to a how much is this worth to me cognitive load. Instead, it controls the distribution of a fixed amount of reader funds onto writers during a time period. No buying decision. Same low cognitive barrier as for the share or like buttons. Interesting. At what percentage of readers experiencing such low barriers would this be likely to generate the same or more income than using advertising? What is the trend that this estimate has given the recent catastrophic events and upcoming public disapproval? We'll find out later. Welcome back to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Annette Roots Radio. And we are, uh, let's see, I got some other fun things seem to be sliding by on Twitter. So we'll try and capture those for perhaps later discussion. But uh, I had to leave things hanging, didn't get to cram in all I wanted to do just before the break. Let's uh, continue on with and wrap up on this article, then clean up on the comments. I think this has generated a lot of interest uh, in, via comments on Twitter, but let's, we, we got to find our way back first to Paul's PhD blog. blog. Uh, so the question of this idea of instead of tapping on share or like buttons you could instead tap on a button that says support. How you would build this sort of thing is only vaguely hinted at here. Essentially, uh, I guess you'd have to have some sort of online digital bank account, essentially connected with your online presence, persona or a Facebook uh, um, uh, account or whatever. And instead of click every time when you click on like or share, you click on a support button and some micro payment is distributed from your online funds to the online bank account of the person who wrote or created the content that you are supporting. People have proposed this. Lots of people have proposed this. Apparently, nobody's been able to make it work, and I'm not exactly sure why that is, but there are some pretty comprehensive studies about you know the failures of various micro payment schemes online. And, uh, of course, we've seen a number of not even micropayment schemes fail online, even as we attempted to use them, like, uh, well, for instance, recurrency, unfortunately. One of the first places that we used here on the show to try and allow people to make ongoing monthly sustaining contributions. Patreon came in to, uh, uh, to the rescue, I guess, as a successor of sorts, I guess, or original competitor to recurrency. Um, uh, but still no one has been able to make it possible to drop, you know, literally a dime or a quarter or a dollar, uh, in the bucket without having major portions of it siphoned off such that it was no longer worth doing. 
Anyway, uh, the other bigger question that we cut off before the break, at what percentage of readers experiencing such low barriers of just clicking a button would it be likely to generate the same or more income than using advertising? What is the trend this estimate has given the recent catastrophic events and the upcoming public disapproval of engagement maximization techniques? Uh, a bold prediction for, I think, November 2016. Looking back, it seems less bold, but, you know, it took us a while to get here. That there, But predicting that there would be an upcoming public disapproval of engagement maximization techniques. It only, only for us, for me personally, I guess it really wasn't until a few days ago that I really found uh, someone putting, you know, coherent and understandable words to the real problem of what Facebook was doing and how the Trump campaign, for instance, was able to uh, make use of it. That is to say, uh, the stickier, the more engaging the content. I mean, that makes sense as a business model for, like I said yesterday, for the guys who were just like, man, we just wanted to make an online forum where you could look at pictures of hot chicks and rate them. Okay. I mean, that's a bad idea for a number of reasons. But uh, relative to making Donald Trump the president of the United States, fairly low on my, you know, low priority on my list of things to smash. But okay, uh, I get the point. So how do we get to this future in which uh, people are supporting things directly so that it isn't an engagement process issue where uh, uh, people who are smart enough to say, I can see that this is a high fiber diet of healthy stuff, healthy information here to use the, uh, it was an Eli, uh, who's, who does the information diet? Was that, uh, I can't remember whether that was, uh, which of the, of the online gurus that was, let me check that out. Cause it was, there was the filter bubble and then there's the information diet, which I think both describe similar, if not the same phenomena out there. And I guess that's really less important than say, moving on with the article and making room for Joan, by the way, progress towards that future is happening. Uh, again, that being the future where people choose a healthier, people who are smart enough to know that they're choosing a healthy information diet can reward and sustain that the creators of that diet as richly, if not more richly, I would say is probably a good idea, than the creators, let's say, uh, the teenage Macedonian creators of a fake BS diet, right? I mean... The fact remains, the most serious problem of this engagement maximization thing is I can't make ends meet forever without outside assistance in producing a show like this. Daily Coast can't report on the news and accurately reflect the views of millions of progressive activists in the United States and around the world and provide a place for them to get together and share ideas and activism and just plain news without having to uh, constantly be fundraising. And I, you know, even though I'm constantly fundraising, I can't, you know, what do we get? We get managed to scratch together something less than a thousand dollars a month from this community uh, for good information. Whereas in Macedonia, we've got millionaire teenagers who are rolling in piles of cash essentially because Rather than do the work of producing good content that's based in reality, they realize I can become a millionaire making stuff up. Why would you ever go to work if that could be the case? I mean, I've dreamed about it too, right? Like, oh, what if I could I make up garbage and just could I learn the engagement maximization and advertising and placement and linkage techniques and bots, et cetera, that would just turn whatever I stupid thing I made up into a million dollars. I wish I could do that. I wouldn't have the conscience to do that. And I don't have, I guess the technical chops, but it's not that hard and I could probably learn it if I thought there were really a million dollars in it. The point is that, you know, this is worth next to nothing in our current system, this show and Macedonian bull crap is worth a million dollars. Why would I continue? Why would I get up in the morning? I don't know. I'm not really a hundred percent certain. 
Why would anybody else do it? Anybody less driven than me? They're not doing it. They're not interested. That's the answer. Donald Trump is the president, and that's the result. The reality is making up BS for money is sustainable. Like we always thought wingnut welfare. How Who's, who's paying James O'Keefe for this stuff? Well, the digital version of it is, you know, who's paying Macedonian teenagers? Nobody. We are. You are by clicking on dumb stuff, America. And uh, how do we how do we get past this? Well, all right, here's some suggestions how to get there. Progress toward that future is happening. But given the recent events seems much too slow. It certainly is and does. It looks like a chicken and egg situation with current platforms and payment providers being the blocking points. But in times like these, independent publishers with an established following may have the power to help create eggs out of thin air. Oh, that's me. All right, well, let's see. If you see some truth or flaws in that hypothesis, I kindly ask you to let me know about your thoughts on it. It's an unfinished piece. I needed to get it out of my head in order to be able to think of something else again. I'm a nerd slash cyber hippie from Austria, a nation that has a specific history of in fear-driven populism. Chances are that these effects will soon make demagogues rise to power over here, too. And we did very nearly see that, didn't we? But I believe that if it's true that technology and greed brought us here, it's also true that better technology and courage will take us from here in the long run. And then a brief thanks for reading. There's also then the next thing is populism in the electronic age, which I imagine is an entry somewhat similar. Uh, that would be the immediate the previous entry, by the way, but I, I thought really uh, very interesting and clear thinking for so early in the process and lots of additional angles to add to our own processing of all of this information. Uh, let's see some comments that came in along the way. Uh, one pronunciation guide, Michael Mushin, telling us that the letter X generally sounds like the sort of a KZ in German words, like the English word hex. In other words, the actual pronunciation of X. So I guess we were talking about, yeah, unfortunately. Now, the, the big question is how you pronounce the U in F-U-X in German. Am I saying the kind of word that will get me in trouble or am I saying Fuchsjäger? I mean, if it was Fuchs, I would imagine I would have uh, anticipated seeing F-U-C-H-S, but I'm not sure. So somebody tell me how we can deal with this. And I guess if I add the Jaeger on the end of it, I can get away with saying anything. So I can say, you know, like, whatever. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to you know, bleep Jaeger and it should be fine. It's not the word. It's something Jaeger. It's, it's German. Germans have the word for everything. Uh, let's see. What else have we got here? Oh, yes. Uh, John Rodia uh, tweeting, I guess, by way of our earlier comments about engagement maximization. And of course, the more Russian bots that liked it, the cheaper the Facebook ads were. And yes, that was uh, one of the chief uh, threads, I guess, of the discussion yesterday and part of uh, the nexus of collusion. If you have a state-sponsored army of bots and trolls, trolls to uh, try and come up with the most sensationalist, most salacious, most divisive, and then therefore most engaging spin on stolen information that just happens to, in a vertical integration situation, have been stolen by the you know one of your other operational arms, hackers employed through the Russian government or the by the oligarchs who essentially make up the de facto Russian government. And all they do all day long is mine information that will feed the fevered brains that make up the engagement maximalization sensationalist poison. And then you can guarantee the efficacy of that work by making it trend with an army of Russian controlled hacker controlled bots that expose it to more eyes who will also find it engaging. And then it begins to take on what looks a little bit more like an organic style engagement maximization. If you can boost anything to the trending list by the use of enough automated bots, 
then I suppose you can manipulate the algorithm very easily and create news out of anything. It doesn't matter if you made it up. In fact, it's best if you did, because then you can make it as salacious and engaging as you want. Then you can fake engagement levels by simply having everybody, you know, all the bots share it so that by the time organic humans get a look at it, it's already popular. It's in front of their eyes because it is popular, even if the content itself doesn't get to their eyes because the engagement maximization algorithm has delivered it. The trending algorithm will have delivered it and then people will have the opportunity to decide whether it is engaging enough for them to share, quote unquote, organically from that point on. It's really quite clever. It's just terrible. It's a terrible information diet. Uh, back on a previous story, that is the blessings of the AR-15s at the so-called church. I have seen this objection made elsewhere, and it is true. Matthew Rigdon, uh, done giving me technical advice for the moment, says, not sure I would call it a church, this sanctuary church, which, of course, they call a church. It is, according to the articles, every single one, really, that actually discusses the situation. Uh, it's the moon. It's a Mooney church. The what do they call it? Is it the unification church? The old uh, bugaboo from the uh, 70s and 80s, Sun Myung Moon. Uh, and I guess his successors, uh, in fact, the man who leads this church is the son of Sun Myung Moon, although I have no idea how many sons Sun Myung Moon has. There was a very weird situation. If you don't remember the Moonies, uh, do, do, do kids today understand what the Moonies are? Children of the 70s and 80s have a better perception of all that, but time for us to shift gears, no doubt. Uh, it was already time for us to shift gears anyway. Joan McCarter joining us. But uh, just to sum up what Matthew Rigdon was pointing out, the man who leads this Pennsylvania church where they are blessing the AR-15s. You've heard about this one probably, Joan. Yes, uh, indeed. A Mooney church. And for those of you who are, I, I, it occurs to me that there may be uh, young adults who actually don't like remember the Moonies or never heard of them. They just sort of became less of a, of a threat somehow, but generally regarded as something of a cult. And in fact, like the very definition of it, uh, although Matthew does point out Moonies do tend to be strong Republican supporters. And, uh, I know for many years and maybe still the case, the Washington times, which holds itself out as a competitor to the Washington post, but really just doesn't fit in the same category or have anything close to the same circulation or respect that the Washington post does was, moon church owned and operated for many years and i think still is and i guess therefore no surprise that really you know like over the cliff republicans uh end up subscribing to the washington times and that the moon family and moon church would would build such a newspaper for themselves so uh another just sort of weird uh, collusion nexus, if you will, even though it doesn't involve any Russians. But uh, yeah, those are the guys who I guess are blessing the AR-15s so long as they are verifiably uh, unloaded and rendered safe, which is a weird thing for them to have to worry about since everybody who has one is a gun expert and gun adept and could probably be guarding a school and will with a blessed rifle starting today. Okay, so we can leave all of that behind, at least temporarily. Uh, you just took me back 20 some years no. yeah <laughs> to to when i was working on the hill for congressman wyden and we yes. got an invitation to it, it was vague it was strange but he was getting an award and i can't remember for what it was it was something very <laughs> okay. innocuous yeah. very bland very positive and he of course wasn't going to go so i had to go in his place to get this award hmm. and it was most members of Congress ending up getting this certificate. Yes. But it was a unification church. Yeah, I remember seeing a lot of photographs of those things, that uh, of those ceremonies. I, I guess they just ended up awarding it eventually to like every influential member of government that they could trick into coming to get the thing. And they tricked me, and I was so angry. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you weren't the senator, so. Right. But yeah, right. They, they ended up with a lot of 
not very, I, I don't know, I guess they could have been incriminating, although they didn't end up being very incriminating. Photos of members of, you know, the, of Congress, of various administrations, et cetera, in, in, engaging in these kooky ceremonies, some of which were really right. weird. You know, shaking the hand and getting the certificate. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, it, it was entirely photo bait, trying to yeah. lure in members of Congress to get those pictures. And uh, occasionally, some of the ones that I saw involved, like when they could actually get the members of Congress or members of uh, important government, you know, office holders to show up, uh, they occasionally at some of these events would would crown them in a weird way. They would you know put some sort of ceremonial crown on their heads, and they I, I got so, I got to see some very weird pictures of some very dumb members of Congress allowing themselves to be like crowned by people in robes, and it was a bizarro thing. But uh, yeah, uh, if they couldn't sucker you into that, they'd at least be giving you a certificate that they would encourage you, I guess, to frame and put on the wall in the office. And and then you were like officially connected to the Moonies. And I don't know whether that helped or hurt or whatever, but the, the Mooney phenomenon sort of faded in terms of being, you know, a, a, a boogeyman, you know, back in the, like if you're, like I said, a child of the 70s and 80s, uh, parents or grandparents or somebody or, you know, after school specials, whatever it was, would warn you, oh, my God, don't don't get recruited by the Moonies. You know, it was the sort of thing you worried about if your children were walking uh, the, the, down the street in the cities or going to an airport. Uh, you know, you would be kidnapped or, or converted by Moonies or some <laughs> other weird cult. And uh I guess then that whole thing went mainstream, and I guess once we were swamped with evangelicals of various stripes, it no longer seemed so weird. You're already in a cult, so you're safe. So don't worry about it. You're not going to be co-opted by Moonies because you know that uh, you know we're all going to hitch a ride on a comet out of here. Well, the the Moonies didn't do themselves any favors by trying to be sort of surreptitious. Mm, about it remember okay. they would have the mass wedding ceremony yes that was kind of uh, that's how most people who do remember and publicize them, them and have them on tv yeah so yeah they, they weren't very good at you know stealth recruiting no it was very weird and i think i wonder i'm curious whether the government of south korea ever you know leaned on them to sort of tamp down on that stuff because it wasn't until after uh the the Mooney scare kind of faded that uh, South Korea really entered into you know a full integration in the in the Pacific Rim and the world economy and American investment began to flow there when people no longer feared being uh, you know kidnapped by the Moon Unification Church for visiting <laughs> Seoul. You did, and you did go to Seoul, not for that reason, right? And we were I not. I did go to Seoul. They did not get me. There you go. So now it's safe. I'm not saying you got to stay away from Korea. They just had the Olympics. I don't, don't yeah. think anybody was captured there, though they were all doping. So you know, it's <laughs> no, easy to run away. Oh, right. Yes, right. Them. That's <laughs> the who curler. Yes, which is still amusing to me. Yeah, well, some really clean ice he was able to provide. And uh, yeah. I, apparently that's cheating. So, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, the moon thing. Us old people, we remember them. I'm going to look for some of those photos. <laughs> but uh, what else on our plate today? I, we Last week, there wasn't as much happening because Congress isn't doing anything normally, and then they were also not there. Has right. that changed at all? Or are they They're still there. Asleep? Okay. They're doing things, mm -hmm. not a lot of things. Um, and this is actually creating sort of a problem within the Republican Party because, you know, what's the Republican Party if they're not having a little bit of a war? Mitch yeah. McConnell wants to limit what they're doing before November. Um, mm -hmm. There is, and we can talk about this a little bit, a uh, Wall Street reform rollback. Wall Street that Republicans, Republicans are putting forward. Mike Crapo from Idaho, mm -hmm. DA. And um, unfortunately, some of the quote-unquote moderate Democrats, um, John Tester, which why he – he's on the banking committee, and um, I've never understood why in Montana Tester feels the need 
to align himself so tightly with the banksters. Oh. It's not a good look for Tester coming from yeah, Montana. Sort of populist Montana yeah. where there are no big banks. Although, you know, they they do well by him in his campaign committee. So uh, that's uh, that sometimes is enough. I'm, uh, so we're going to have yeah. some work to do trying to pry Tester Heidkamp um Warner away from this reform a little bit because it is not good news. Oh. And it's not electorally popular. I wrote on this yesterday that we've got some polling from PPP that shows people are still very concerned at the influence Wall Street has in Congress and at the possibility that we have another meltdown. Hmm. And they're right to be concerned because what Crapo and these handful of Democrats want to do could could loosen regulations on banks and could put us back where we were. Hmm. Um, so that so that's bad. one of the things that McConnell wants to do this session, the remainder of the session. Um, but that's about all he wants to do besides nominations. Hmm. And his Republicans who are running, Ted Cruz high among them, wants more. He wants another stab at Obamacare repeal. He wants red meat that he can run on in Texas. Mm, yeah. And uh, he's probably not going to get it. So we're going to have another contentious several months in the Senate with these rabble rousing Republicans. Um, the House is going to do what the House does, which is be the House. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. And what does that even mean anymore? I don't know. But. I guess nothing good. No, they're all free to make ridiculous suggestions like uh, Mark Meadows made the other day about, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, inserting himself in the armed teacher debate and uh, floating the idea of tax credits for anybody who would volunteer to go guard schools with their guns. So it's a, because just what we need, more random right. people showing up with right. guns outside of schools. Yeah, and sometimes they, you know, if we tax incentivized that, that that could only make things better. <laughs> Why not pay lunatics to show up at schools with their guns? I don't know. That seems like the opposite of what we ought to be doing, you know, given that it we It seems all, like, yeah. We were all told that paying people things makes them do it more often, so... That sounds the weird. Oath Keepers really want yeah. to do this, supposedly. Yes. Only one thus far that I've seen has actually shown up outside of a school voluntarily yeah. in Indiana, I believe. Uh, uh, yes, although he says there are hundreds like him all across, just in eastern Indiana. I don't, I don't believe that for a moment, but uh, there could be another one somewhere. But that's which all it will takes. certainly be. Um, comforting to the students of color. Mm, yes, right. In well, all of these places. Yeah, some of them have fewer of those students than others, but wherever they uh, are, and, uh, and, and, and you don't have to be a student of color to worry when a guy shows up at your school with a big gun. But, you know, uh, I don't know there, I'm sure there are some people who uh, will look at it and say, oh, no, that's a good guy. I can tell by the fact that he's wearing a a biker style leather vest with weird insignias and patches all over it because they say Oath Keeper as opposed to Hell's Angel, which would make people think bad things. It says Oath Keeper, which is a different gang name, but it's a gang of good guys because they say so. But you still want to worry about the kids of color showing up at that school. Yeah, right. Well, you do. You have to worry about them because what makes Oath Keepers jumpy? You know, mm -hmm. teenagers Brown of color. <laughs> right. Black males who all look to be in their, you know, mid-20s, even when they're 12, apparently. Um, yeah, and Oath Keepers are just full of it in general, and they show up at stupid places and... Uh, uh, say they're there to preserve the peace, but they tend to show up in places like uh, Charlottesville to make right. sure that nobody hits Nazis. That's not really right. what we were interested in. Well, and they put themselves in places where they might have confrontations with law enforcement. Yes, they do tend to. And like they do it on purpose. 
Uh, yeah, and they think they're safe because uh, they claim on their website that the law, the law enforcement officers are very often among their membership. Now, all right, uh, well, we'll return to that topic and much more. Uh, can you hear our music? Have we repaired that for you as well? I can hear the music, Okay, yes. so that tells us that uh, we're at this point now 15 seconds from taking our break. So uh, we'll come back after our short two-minute break with a recap of, A, what we've been talking about, and B, what we're going to be looking ahead to in the coming day and week when we return with Joan McCarter. We'll be right back. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for Kago in the Morning, interrupting this little break to say thanks so much to all of you who are contributing supporters of Kago in the Morning. Thousands of you are downloading the show each day, but fewer than 1 in 25 regular listeners are donating to help keep us on the air. For the money you'd spend on a single three-minute iTunes song, we bring you two hours of great news and entertainment every day, five days a week. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy. You can find us there by searching k X or David Waldman or k in the Morning or even Daily Coast Radio in their search box, and you'll be right where you need to be to make easy, recurring, monthly contributions to support our show. Once again, thanks so much for your support. Welcome back to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Joan McCarter still with us, uh, hanging on patiently during the, our break. Uh, and we had some fun digging up old pictures of people who got roped into going to moon uh, ceremonies of various kinds. And I see lots of photos of those mass weddings. Hard to believe those aren't photoshopped now, looking back. Entire stadiums filled with people in tuxedos and bridal gowns. That's a... Uh, I'm sure it was a special memory for them, too, <laughs> their, their day. Okay. Well, at any rate, uh, turning our attention I wonder how to, many of those couples are still together. That's a good question. And, yeah, and how many of them were performers in the opening ceremonies uh, the, in the, the Olympics? This is what it looks like when you see one of the aerial photos of these mass weddings. If they all twirled at the same time, it could be a good show. Anyway, uh, let's see. We were also discussing where we might – take the show after the break and what subjects need to be covered. Uh, DACA, as you mentioned, uh, we discussed a little bit yesterday. Armando brought us uh, up to speed on the latest from the Supreme Court not taking up the issues. Uh, so that was good news, at least for the upcoming or what used to be the deadline that uh, Trump set for rolling back the the uh, DACA orders from the previous administration. What else can we add to this? Where do we stand? And what, if anything, does Congress actually have a, do they have a shot at bringing anything to the floor that matters at all anytime soon? The only shot it seems like they really have is with the next looming, ta-da, government shutdown. <laughs> oh, my God. March all 24th. Right. Uh, March 24th. Or 23rd. I've seen both oh. dates. I think it's the 24th. <laughs> they don't know anymore because they moved it to Thursday once and now they can't right. figure it out. <laughs> Are either of those days Thursday? Good question. <laughs> I'll look on the calendar. But now they're fooling around with those dates and it's not a bad idea to do some tinkering. And, and, and if it wasn't, you know, quite so automatic and they actually paid attention to the calendar, that wouldn't be a bad thing either. The difference this time around, uh, the government can still shut down if they don't pass something. Yeah. Um, they have come up with a budget this time. So this yeah. might be might be the last government shutdown threat we see for a while. Hmm. Okay. Unless something blows all up and this budget all falls right. apart, um, which I don't foresee happening. But this is the last opportunity to seize a, a government shutdown kind of a moment and try to make something happen on DACA. Um, there are still folks meeting. Jeff Flake's trying to push it. Um, Lindsey Graham is still meeting on it, and Democrats are still clamoring mm. for it. Um, the likeliest, if anything is likely, is a little bit of border wall whatever 
border security funding okay. and a few year possible extension on DACA. Um, mm. We'll see. All right. uh, who knows where where Trump is going to land at any given moment? Yeah. Uh, so March twenty third is the Friday. So okay, so that's it'll be the probably 23rd. more likely. <laughs> the brief experiment with Thursday, I guess, is out the window. But uh, so and this Friday is the second, so that would give us one, two, three weeks uh, at the end of this week, which is probably you know already lost. It's already Wednesday. They haven't done anything. So yeah, it'll yet. be tomorrow afternoon. Will be the end of this week for yeah. Congress. Uh, so March already by that point, and so three weeks really to work on a solution for going forward for continuing to fund the government and then you'll throw daca and who knows what else at that uh, if that is in fact the last opportunity to cram something into a must pass bill there'll probably be competition for it. usually there's four or five moving parts that could compete for some if not all of that space but like you said there's really not much in the way of legislative initiatives going on in the Congress. No. Huh. DACA is still, even though the arbitrary deadline that Trump set now is is gone, thanks to the Supreme Court, um, these kids are still losing status and can still be deported. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a blanket protection. The Supreme Court decision not to take up the case is not a blanket protection for these kids. Yeah, these young people. That still leaves things in flux. Uh, and, it does. Yeah, they're still vulnerable, and and action still needs to happen on the congressional level. Hmm. So while lots of them may look at that and think, "Oh, okay, pressure's off," it's not. Okay. Well, that's a way to keep us uh, uh, disoriented and. And on our heels, so uh, I'm sure which is exactly that. yeah <laughs> where we're at with pretty much everything right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, all right. So if that's what's occupying their time, I mean, I guess also otherwise procedurally speaking, the budget having been adopted somewhere, presumably appropriations subcommittees are meeting and are working. Right. Yeah. And and making decisions um, for things like getting rid of the, I can't remember what it's called now. I wrote about it on Monday. Mm -hmm. a, a six person oh, specimen right. collecting team. What? <laughs> in the Department of Interior that's oh. housed at the Smithsonian. And These researchers, researchers collect flora and fauna specimens save them, have a bank of them saved at the Smithsonian, and it's a tremendous resource for scientists studying evolution, studying oh, species uh -oh. <laughs> response to global warming and yeah, to that. habitat change, uh, all of these kinds of things. That's going to be shut down. Of course. It might save us. So, And there are going to be lots of little things like that that get the axe now. Hmm. They've been still surviving under Trump, even though Republicans have always wanted to get rid of him because Republicans haven't been able to do an actual budget. No. Oh. So they've existed thanks to the continuing resolution. Hmm. Oh, they yeah, were paid right. for in the last budget. We can only do okay. a CR, so they're going to keep being funded at That's a good CR point. levels hmm. until a budget is passed and they get the ax. So, yeah, any number of things that have been surviving so far, and I guess probably convincing a lot of people, well, it's not as bad as the, all that. It, just like everything else, predictions of doom on a change of administrations or change of parties, and it doesn't come to fruition. But I guess, you know, now the mechanism to 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 eliminate some of these things is moving forward. And I guess yep. the budget has, all right, well, that's interesting. Of course, because it might save us. Uh, it has to be eliminated, and the excuse is, I don't Anything believe in evolution. Having or... to do with any kind of science, yeah, pretty I much. Think we can say is going to be gone. I wonder what kind of overlap there is between people who. I mean, I guess that's that's the coalition that Republicans now have put together on the conservative side. Is if you are an oil man and you make your money through oil and maybe gas mining. Um, 
you fight against uh, you know the the uh, scale back of the use of fossil fuels because it would hurt your pocketbook, but you team up with the people who say global warming and climate change is a hoax. And I wonder what kind of overlap they have with people who say, uh, you know, believe quietly in their own minds. No, uh, climate change isn't a hoax. It is real and it will bring about the end of life on Earth. But I like that because I'm a dominionist and I believe right. Jesus will come back. Oh, but did, why? Why would he come here? There's no humans left. I don't know. But OK, you know, strange and mysterious. I don't know. Don't have the answer for you. But I wonder how much overlap there is with, you know, dominionists who are like, I'm looking to create a world ending crisis. So that there's well, some rapture. There are a action. lot of folks who voted for Trump because of that. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> rapture fetishists who thought he would bring it on. Yeah. And then uh, over here on the left, you got uh, the folks who say, I'm just waiting for the giant meteor anyway. So what the hell? Right. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. They want a habitable planet until that point. Like I want to be until able to see the meteor. Point. So, so science out the window. But there are also other things like yes, more immediate, more painful for people. Social security. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the yeah the that? budget that Trump has proposed and that will probably be accepted for social security means there's going to be less staff able to help. Social Security Administration has already undergone a lot of cuts. Mm -hmm. Where they couldn't cut benefits, they decided to punish the administration. Oh. So less and less staff working more and more hours with older and older technology means less ability to serve the public. Mm. That's an interesting way of approaching it. Like we, it. It's either legally impossible or a political third rail to cut Social Security benefits <clears throat> so I can – promise that i'm not going to but if i fire all the stamp lickers you won't get your check just the same so i didn't cut your benefits i just didn't send them to you yeah or i can't help you get them or i accidentally sent you half as much quote unquote accidentally and when you call to say what happened to my social security benefits you said you weren't going to cut them uh no one will answer the phone and if they do by some chance accidentally answer the phone they say i didn't cut them uh, you did though. I got a lot less than I usually get. Uh, hold, please. The phone doesn't get answered. The <laughs> yeah. it, it's it's hmm. a problem. And and Trump's budget for this year, Washington Post has a new story today. Uh, requests calls for almost a thousand fewer full time equivalent work years in 2019 than this year. Ooh. That's the amount of work a person working full time will do in a year. So a thousand fewer of those. That's not so good. So oh, okay. that cuts their ability to respond to demand by about a third. Hmm. That is bad news. All right. Let me see if I can. Uh... Wow. About 10,000 baby boomers hit retirement <laughs> age every day. Oh, uh, yes. So you've got a ballooning workload. In a shrinking work schedule, and it means a lot of people are going to be pissed when they can't get Social Security on the phone, which, of course, undermines Social Security. Yes. Makes Probably. it less popular, makes it easier to just get rid of someday, which has always been the Republican uh, aim. Yeah. Well, look, they can cut their phone budget as well. We just have fewer mm -hmm. phones. Sorry, can't help you. Wow. All right. Well, that's in a, a sneaky way of uh, of approaching that issue uh, and and he'll stand there of course uh trump could stand there and say i'm not cutting it even if he was just outright cutting it he would just say i'm not and some yeah. percentage of the population would believe that about 30 percent, i think would would just say yeah i do believe it and even if i don't it's great it's not just happening with social security administration pretty much any agency that provides service to people mm. one of them being the irs I haven't seen what the proposed cuts are to the IRS, but it's already overwhelmed, understaffed, and has ridiculously bad technology. Yeah. And this year, they're going to be trying to figure out how to also implement the new tax law. Some of the things in the tax law were retroactive, would apply for people filing this year. Most right. of them are for next year. But the IRS is trying to provide guidelines on all of that, provide guidance, and deal with 
what it has to deal with every year in April, mm. <laughs> processing everybody's yes. returns with fewer staff and really ridiculously outdated technology. Yeah. Well, that's a problem for them all the time, and uh, it only gets worse and worse each year. So, yeah, they got to figure. They have to read that so-called tax reform and figure out what it means. And in a lot of places, it just says the IRS shall develop, you know, guidelines or regulations regarding whatever vague idea they they actually passed in the bill. And they're the ones who have to turn it into usable guideline language. And they do that while they're opening up all your envelopes. With your right. with your tax returns in it, and trying to get things right. Interesting. Uh, On top of that, hmm. I don't know if you saw the story from a few days ago. There are humongous amounts of errors in the tax law I because most of it. it was written on a napkin, and <laughs> <laughs> right. scrawled in the margins of hmm. the legislation. There's right. a whole bunch of problems with it. I didn't see all the individual ones, uh, but I did see that there was a story on it. And uh, I just, I, at that point, I like, I'm rolling my eyes. Of course. I wonder what of they course. are. And then I never got to it because, you know, Trump went crazy. This is what happens when you don't have a normal legislative process. Yeah. Uh, and it right. happens in the normal legislative process, too. But usually the errors are smaller. Right. Typos. You Stuff find that them. doesn't you know, really make a huge amount of difference. But um, some of these are pretty big. Oh. <laughs> affecting farmers, affecting corporations, affecting real estate agencies, all mm. of the people that they wrote the bill for. Oh, I was supposed to help you, but I I wrote, Oops. yeah, <laughs> I went to type help, but I instead I typed hurt. Is that okay <laughs> with you? You're good with that? Hmm. What's kind of fun in that is that Republicans are, are sort of begging Democrats to help them fix these things, <laughs> ah, to do ah. technical corrections. And Republic, uh, Democrats are thinking, hmm, hmm, when's the last time we were hurt by a technical hmm. correction that didn't get made a massive legislation? Yeah. Huh, that would be the Affordable Care Act, and that would be something you decided to sue us over. Right. So, yeah, maybe we're not going to help you out. Right away yeah. on this one. It's one of those dilemmas that uh, really are unique for Democrats. Is like, well, you know, it, This will be such a black eye for Republicans that you want to say, go get your black eye, man. You just picked a fight that you're going to lose. Go you know, take your punishment. And then, of course, you realize, well, I don't know. The legislation now says hurt farmers or hurt families I, rather than help it's not really families that, that are going to be hurt well, though tr- yeah, it's I mean, it's i guess that's farm corporations it's big operations so right. i don't think democrats really All right, then. need to feel and a great urgency in helping republicans out on this one mm. all right well i i hope they're analyzing the situation closely and uh, it'd be it'd be well i hope nice they to... extract a few concessions you out would... of it you would we'll think help they'd you be able if. to do that. Yeah, well, there better be the case. It's certainly not just going to be, well, yeah, you screwed up. All right, hang on. I'll, I'll be right over with my eraser. Yeah, you would have to say, yeah, it's going to cost something. So, and all right, it's well, so they cost can trade a for? lot. Yeah, for a major so, screw up. So, you know, the good news in all of this is that filing taxes this year is going to be as messy as ever. A lot of people aren't going to realize that the new tax law isn't in effect, and they're going to hit taxes and oh. think Congress was supposed to fix this. They didn't. Hmm. Uh, it's not going to make the tax law any more popular than it was when it passed. Mm, yeah, not likely. And I... since Republicans think that's the thing that they're going to be running on for 2018, Oh. It's good news for Democrats. I guess so. I'll take it. They really think that. I take huh? what you can get, Kegra. Yeah, I guess so. There's nothing else out there. Uh, well, let's see. So, hmm. I'm just sort of curious about what sort of things they might be able to trade for. The, yeah, we'll have to speculate that on that. Uh, well, there are there are a few changes to Obamacare that would be helpful. Yeah, I guess that's true. Well, you know, like, you 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 know. Fixing the error that that didn't allow regular appropriations to, to for the cost sharing reduction payments mm-hmm. to insurance companies, that'd be an easy one to fix. Yeah, we'll fix that error. You fix your error, and we'll fix our error, and we'll trade. But that's too reasonable. So, don't way do too it. reasonable. All right. 
Well, that's uh, not astonishing, of course, that they would have run into those things. And, you know, uh, like you said, they do get mistakes get made in a regular process as well. But, yeah, it, it certainly does help if you hold a hearing or two, then people can read things section by section and say, oh, this says the opposite of what you want. Yeah, when when you're doing your markup at Tortilla Flats or wherever, <laughs> And just scrawling stuff out onto right. the margins. That's not really a markup. Yeah. That's, and that's, that's not conducive to catching major errors and right. correcting them. And the staff can't read it. I don't know what this says. There's salsa on it. I, it might say 10 million. I'm not sure. Fine. We'll just go <laughs> ahead with that. Well, you know, the IRS does have a lot on its plate, as you mentioned. By the way, how come he's not firing the people who are taking so long on his audit? is thinking of firing the special counsel. He's toying with that, but he can't, you know, he's totally honest about his taxes, but he's been under audit for 17 years or whatever. Uh, why can't he stay? Yeah, that out? he could do something about that now that he's president, couldn't yeah, he? Yeah, like I'm going to end that audit already so that I can finally release my taxes. But apparently that seems to be a lingering problem. He can't really quite figure out as maximum leader uh, who he needs to lean on to get the thing done right. Because, you know, he doesn't want to be seen as influencing the process, I'm sure. Right, right. Meanwhile, he is uh, proposing a new leader for the IRS, a new IRS commissioner or whatever it's called, who is, of course, a lawyer who has spent his career <laughs> helping people avoid uh -huh. paying taxes. Well, helping corporations avoid paying taxes. Yeah, well, you can really help if you're the commissioner. Uh, yeah, there's lots of you know. I got, I got an idea about how I can get rid of your well, your audit, for instance, or that time they said no, 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 you owe ten million dollars in taxes, not ten dollars. It's ten million. I instead of uh, lobbying the commissioner to change that, why don't I just become commissioner? And I guess that's possible now that. For instance, Trump's pilot is on the top of the list right. for being FAA. At least, you know, this sure. time it's a guy who understands how the IRS works. Yes, that is true. And uh, it does go both ways. I mean, when you uh, hire a lawyer like that because you hear your the ad on the radio that says, you know, don't fight the IRS alone. Our staff of attorneys all well, used to be IRS auditors and we know how to get you out of it. Come hire us. That that's a revolving door we're all kind of used to seeing for a long time, and this would just uh, would revolve one more time. And guy goes back into uh, into the IRS, except this time as the chief. Yeah. All right. A guy who is built, but he has a devised, according to to um, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. He oh. has advised the IRS and state tax commissions on how they could better um, operate, you know, how, how to be more effective. But mostly he's represented rich people and corporations and uh, figure out how, how, how to mm. screw the government, <laughs> how okay. not to pay their taxes. Well, not with clients with offshore holdings. Hmm. Oh, hmm. so well, there's none of that nonsense going on anymore, right? Everybody has their money here in the good old U.S. of A., not in Grand Cayman Island or Switzerland or, or uh, Cyprus. Hotels or... in Panama. Yeah. No. Have you been following David Fahrenholt? Uh, and his, I always do, but what's his he... tweeting on whatever is happening with the. Panama Hotel, Trump's Panama Hotel. Uh, I have not been following it, although now that you mention it, I said uh, something unusual and weird happened very recently, and now I can't put my Two finger on it. Two days running now. It's still happening. There's security, like Panama police forces Yeah. at raiding the, the Trump's Panama Hotel. Okay. And are they? Uh, I thought I read like there's there's some kind of incredible shredding party going on. We have well. no idea what's going on. Oh, well, 
We should find out. So the police, the, the Panamanian, Panamanian police have been there. The police and Ministry of Labor people have oh. been there. Okay. Um, at one point, there were like people with, with riot gear. Huh. For doing so it's, what? it's very interesting. We, I'm not sure what's going on, but it's very okay. interesting. Well, now I know what the Friday show will have to be about. I have to. I think I may have to do a rerun or tape a show. I might as well tape it today. We're invading Panama on Friday, everybody. <laughs> That's what we're doing. We're going to... We probably will be. We're yes. going to Noriega those Panamanians again. They've gotten out of control. They think the President of the United States is a criminal. We'll have to show them by invading them that that's not true and support the troops. There you go. Uh, so that's the Friday show. Thank you for tipping us go. off on that yeah. one. Uh, I yeah, I better check in on that. It's eh? free to find out what the hell's happening in Panama. Yeah, David Farenthold. Okay, well, he usually has a pretty good handle on these things. I bet when he started this beat, I bet he never thought he'd be, I thought, I'm sure he never thought he'd be a war correspondent. <laughs> but. No. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, he's really, uh, you know, made a niche for himself, and it's just because it's such a rich vein to mine. I guess you didn't have to be a total genius to say, I'll take the Trump corruption beat, because that's good yeah. work, and that'll be steady. But, man. It's, and, yeah, it's job security. Yeah, and it wasn't something he was handed either. It was just sort of like, you know, his starting with the this guy says he's raising money. I'm going to skip the debate to raise money for veterans. Okay, did you do it? No. Oh my God, he's such a cheater. He he really didn't. Uh, I'm going to start investigating the way this guy handles his money, and then boom, job security forever. Yes. Another another crisis of Trump's own making that his own big mouth created out of nowhere. Well, that's how he gets himself in trouble. Uh, all right. Well, I'll check that out. Panama. Note Panama. to self. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll all check that out. It's about time, well, nearly time for us to uh, wrap up and hand things over to Justice for the end of the day. Thank you for coming by. And uh, if there's anything else that we can squeeze in before our music rolls, we still have a minute or two. Uh, well, we're going to be talking, of course, more Parkland, more gun control. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Because this time really does feel like it's going to be different. Yeah, I hope so. And, you know, there's a and, moment And here. we're also going to be beating up a little bit on Marco Rubio, who <laughs> deserves Marco. it more than just about anybody these days. Yeah, well, he does. And he's a real waste of space in the Senate, honestly. Uh, all right, yeah, what, uh, I mean. Remember when he was going to retire? Yeah, and he really should yeah. have stayed on that plan. I don't know why he yeah. came back. He doesn't appear interested in doing anything. He's very fatalistic about things. I mean, I am too, but <laughs> I didn't run for Senate. So, okay. He came back so that he could tweet out Bible verses, apparently. Yeah, that seems to be it. I noticed that uh, early this morning, Benji Sarlin was on his case. Like, what is this garbage he's tweeting now? That uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, but basically he was, he, what did he say? Something like, yeah, we the people... Don't like yeah, each other. Yeah, he, he said the what? debate after Parkland, this is a tweet that I'm reading now, mm -hmm. reminds us that we, the people, all in caps, don't really like each other very much. We smear those who refuse to agree with us. We claim a Judeo Christian heritage, mm -hmm. but celebrate arrogance and boasting. And worst of all, we have infected the next generation with the same disease. So, okay. Parkland students, shut up. You're arrogant and boasting. Oh, is that what that yeah. was supposed to be? Because it ended up kind of, it sounded like you're in, you know, maybe you should seek some counseling. Maybe you're depressed. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but okay. My favorite response was from Simon Malloy, who asked him if he has any more zingers about Trump's dick. <laughs> that was the time. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe that was one of the white lies that Hope Hicks. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, she had to steam his pants all the time. Ew. I'm not saying they had any kind of a relationship. I'm just, Ew. okay. I didn't mean to upset you. All right. Quickly, go and uh, get some water. Get outside and get some air. Sorry about that, Joan. I know you'll recover in time to give us a day's worth of fantastic coverage. In fact, a week's worth until we see you again. 
Thanks so much for coming by. Sorry about that. There's surely something else you can occupy your time with. Uh, I have some suggestions. Next time. Okay. Take care, Joan. For those of you uh, now looking for suggestions to get that off your mind, I didn't. It wasn't. I didn't bring it up. She said it. Now she was just talking about Simon. But okay, we'll blame Simon for this one. And if you need help getting that off your mind or anything else, the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is coming up next. Here's what we got on tap for today. I might as well get right to the story. Starting off in the Bistro Cafe, Georgia State Senator Michael Williams thought he'd drop a right-wing lie about Planned Parenthood getting member discounts from Delta. <laughs> But CNN's Brianna Kaler didn't let him get away with it. On the rest of the menu, tech bros are facing tax hell after the IRS wins access to cryptocurrency data showing unreported capital gains. <laughs> I never From thought of that. Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the K Grub in the Morning Show. With David Waltman. How did they get that access? I thought the whole point of cryptocurrency was that it would be protecting people from that. Uh, Okay, but anyway, the NRA refuses to answer Senator Ron Wyden's questions about funding from Russia. And the professor who told Papadopoulos that Russia had dirt on Hillary has vanished without a trace. My goodness. 